Post-Impressionism is our discussion for this session of AP Art History. The Realist and the Impressionists continued to create art up until the end of the 19th century, but roughly around 1880, they gave up their dominance to a younger generation who saw themselves as the advanced guard or the avant-garde of artists. These artists increasingly defined the avant-garde in terms of visual expression, developing new visual language in a more appropriate to a new formulated message, these artists included the French post-impressionists, reinterpreted art as an expression of an interior world of the imagination and imposed a new scientific rigor on representation of the world around them. An English critic by the name of Roger Fry coined the term post-impressionism right around 1910 to describe a diverse group of painters whose work he had collected for an exhibition. He acknowledged that these artists did not share unified approach in art, but they all used things like Impressionism to be used as a springboard for developing their own styles. Now, one of the vocab words that you should go into your textbook and find is avant-garde. George Seurat, trained in the École du Beaux Arts, sought to correct Impressionism which he found too intellectually shallow. He preferred the clarity of structure he saw in classical relief sculpture and seemingly struck systematic, but actually quite emotive use of color suggested by optics and color theory. Surratt was particularly interested in the law of the simultaneous contrast of colors, formulated in 1820 by Michel Eugene Chevreul. Chevrolet observed that adjacent objects not only cast reflections of their own color onto their neighbors, but also created the effect of their complementary color. When a blue object is set next to a yellow one, the eye will detect in the blue object a trace of purple, the complement of yellow, and in yellow objects a trace of orange, the complement of blue. Seurat's goal was to find ways to create such retinal vibration that enlivened the paint surface. His paint style was distinctively short, multi-directional strokes of almost pure color in what came to be known as divisionism or pointillism. Make sure you understand that these are both the same, but you might encounter this on the AP exam. In theory, these juxtaposed small strokes of color would merge in the viewer's eye to produce the impression of other colors. This is a Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte. Not my best French, but forgive me. It is a monumental painting, six feet, nine inches and a half to 10 feet, one and one quarter inches, uh, exhibited at the eighth and final Impressionist exhibition in 1886. The theme is of weakened leisure and is pretty typical of Impressionists, but the rigorous technique and the stiff formality of the figures and the highly calculated geometry of the composition produce a kind of a solemn effect, uh, quite at odds with the casual naturalism that you would have seen in Impressionism. The entire canvas only uses 11 colors in three values. Viewed from a distance at about nine feet, the painting reads, as figures in a park rendered in many colors and tones. But if you come into a distance of three feet, you begin to see the individual marks of color and they become more salient while the form dissolves into a much more abstract situation. A number of conflicting interpretations have come from this painting. Contemporary accounts of Sundays was a newly designed official day off for the French working families to spend time together. So as we look at the painting, it was noisy, it's littered, it's chaotic. If you take a real close look, somebody's got a small primate on a leash and dogs are running around. Seurat may have intended to represent an ideal image of working class and middle class life and the idea of leisure, a model of how tranquil life should be in the fantasy of a harmonious blending of the classes. Some art historians see Surratt satirizing here the sterile habits and the rigid attitudes of the growing Parisian middle class 
not to mention their own domineering presence within this working class uh, preserve. Another post-impressionist painter is Vincent van Gogh. Among the most famous of the post-impressionist artists, he is a Dutch painter who transformed his artistic source into a highly expressive impersonal style. Van Gogh worked as an art dealer, a teacher, uh, an evangelic preacher before deciding to enter into the field of art. He studied briefly in Brussels, The Hague, and Antwerp. Van Gogh adapted Surratt's pointillism, so that's his inspiration for some of his art, by applying brilliantly colored paint and multi-directional strokes of impasto. Make sure you have this in your notes, which is a thick application of paint to give his picture a turbulent emotional energy and a palpable surface texture. Van Gogh was a socialist who believed that modern life, with its constant social change and focus on progress and success, alienated people from one another and from themselves. His own paintings are efforts to communicate his emotional state by establishing a direct connection between artist and viewer. He produced paintings that contributed significantly to the later emergence of Expressionism, in which the intensity of an artist's emotional state, say Jackson Pollock, for example, will override any desire for fidelity to the actual appearance of things. One of the most famous examples of a Van Gogh is The Starry Night, painted near the Asylum of St. Remy, and careful observations plus the artist's imagination. In this painting, we see a quiet town with the sky pulsated with celestial rhythms and blazes with exploding stars. Contemplating life and death, in a letter Van Gogh wrote, Just as we take the train to get to Tarascon or Rouen, we take death to reach a star. This idea is rendered visibly here by the cypress tree, a traditional symbol of both death and eternal life. The brightest star in the sky is actually a planet, that's Venus, which is associated with love. It's possible that the pictures Extraordinary energy also expresses Van Gogh's euphoric hope of gaining in death the love that he had that had eluded him in life. Van Gogh's brushwork is immediate, expressive, intense, clearly more a record of what he felt than what he really saw. During the last year and a half of his life, he experienced repeated psychological crisis that would last for days and sometimes weeks. While they were raging, he wanted to hurt himself, he heard loud noises in his head, and he just simply could not paint. The composition of the painting is pretty straightforward. The night sky occupies approximately two-thirds of the picture, while the other third is dedicated to the landscape. In the foreground and the middle ground, the movement proceeds from left to right. The ground and sky are connected by a clump of cypress that rise from the bottom of the painting on the left-hand side. In the middle of the sky, there is a large circular swirl of color. Because of its size and prominence, this vortex becomes the central feature of the composition. The landscape that lies beneath the vortex appears to be flattened. The pointed church steeple rises out of the group, of buildings standing out against the hills and extending into the area of sky, like a second line connecting the human world with that above. The band of lines and the colors that make up the whirling vortex come from the extreme left of the picture and goes toward the right, guiding the viewer's eye into the same direction. The whole of the area of the sky has been obsessively filled with curved lines and color series of short, thick, successive strokes of color set the surface in motion. The darker lines are generally continuous. Their changing directions draw the eye into the swirls of dark and light, which create an aura of anxiety and compulsion. The poetic twinkling of the stars, defined by the lighter colors, develops into a frenzy, incessant throbbing. Our last and final artist for this 
discussion is Paul Cezanne. No other artist had a greater impact on the next generation of modern painters than this artist. Born into the family of a prosperous banker in, in Provence, uh, Cezanne studied first in his town and then moved to Paris, where he participated in the circle of realist artists around Manet. Uh, in the early 1870s, Cezanne's style changed because of the influences of Pizarro, and he began to adopt a bright palette a broken brushwork and began painting landscapes. A little bit like the Impressionists with whom he exhibited, Cezanne dedicated himself to the study of what he called the sensation of nature. He wasn't trying to capture the transitory effects of light or atmosphere. He created highly structured paintings through a methodical application of color that would merge drawing and modeling into a single process. Cezanne once said he wanted to make uh, something of Impressionism, something solid and durable, like the art of the museums. This painting done by Paul Cezanne is Mont saint Victoria. Uh, this is a set of mountains that are close to his home. Uh, he did hundreds of drawings of this mountain and about 30 oil paintings up to his death. We're presented with the mountains rising above the Arc Valley, dotted with buildings and trees, and crossed at the far right by a railroad viaduct. Framing the scene to the left is an evergreen tree which echoes the contours of the mountains. This creates visual harmony between the two principal elements of the composition. His handling of the paint is deliberate and controlled. His brushwork, which vary from short parallel hatchings to light lines to broad swaths of flat color, weave together the elements of the painting into a unified but flattened visual surface. The surface design with the pictorial effect of receding space, generating tension between the illusions of three dimensions within the picture and the physical reality of the two-dimensional surface. Recession and the physical reality is sometimes referred to as reposer, R-E-P-O-U-S-S-O-I-R. -E -S -S this is again one of those French words that means something that pushes back. Thus that helps draw the eye into the valley, and by the transition from the saturated hues in the foreground to the lighter values in the background, creating the effect of atmospheric perspective. But recession into depth is challenged by one more intense color in both the foreground and the background, and by the tree branches in the sky, which follow the contours of the mountain, voiding overlapping and subtly suggesting that the two are on the same plane. Photographs of the scene show that Cezanne created composition in accordance with the harmony that he felt the scene demanded, rather than reproducing the detail of the landscape itself. Well, that's it, guys, for today. Don't forget to be getting into your textbooks. This is Chapter 31 of Stokestad. Have a good day.